Hi, and welcome to the Imperfect Podcast. My name is Deb Crow, and I will be your host. Join me on this journey as we meet heart-centered leaders from all over the globe. Lots of interesting questions, interesting conversation, and find out what makes a leader. How do they handle uncertainty and complexity? How do they lead in a time that is volatile? Join us. Welcome back to Imperfect, the Heart-Centered Leadership Podcast. This is your host, Deb Crow. And I'm just, again, I know I keep saying this, guys, but I am finding the most amazing, talented, heart-centered leaders all over the globe. This morning, I want to introduce you to Dr. Roger Landry. Let me tell you a little bit about him. He is a preventative medicine physician. He is also the author of the award-winning Live Long, Die Short, A Guide to Authentic Health and Successful Aging. And he has so many different accolades and awards, and he has had such an amazing trajectory in his own career. He was a flight surgeon in the Air Force for more than 22 years, keeping pilots and other air crew healthy and performing at their best. One of his charges was world famous test pilot Chuck Yeager, and Dr. Landry retired as a highly decorated full colonel and chief flight surgeon at the Air Force Surgeon General's Office in Washington, D.C. After duty on five continents and being medically involved in a number of significant world events, I can tell you that Dr. Landry is without a doubt a heart-centered leader. So Dr. Roger, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Deb. Uh, It's my pleasure, honor. I've been looking forward to this for some time. Well, I'm just, I was reading your bio, doing my research, and I had many people reach out to say that I needed to get you on the show. So I want to thank you for your time today. And I'm ready to showcase your expertise and some great questions. So are you ready? Let's get to it. All right. My first leadership question is, where does your love and passion come from to serve the senior population? Well, I was uh, very fortunate to have parents who were very concerned about the greater good. Probably their whole generation was, the, uh, the greatest generation. And uh, the, the whole idea of uh, the importance of the greater good, I think, was demonstrated by them in World War II and the Great Depression and those sort of things. I was also very fortunate to be educated by Jesuits uh, whose sense of uh, social justice uh, is is immense, and it, you cannot get a diploma from one of those schools without a sense of social justice. As far as older adults, uh, I was trained in medicine, and of course wanted to 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 do the most I could. And I uh, I was very happy to take care of pilots and keep them flying and performing at their best and not crashing and staying alive. And then the rest of the Air Force community. But when I left. Um, I, uh, a book had come out called Successful Aging. It was the result of a 10 year long study from the MacArthur Foundation. In fact, my brother was uh, the chief financial officer of the MacArthur Foundation and he made me aware of it. And it showed uh, for the first time that uh, how we age is really depending on our, dependent on our lifestyle and the choices we make up to 70%. And with the demographic changing the way it was soon, you know, 25% of people, well, 20% and very soon after 25% will be over 65. So there was a huge need and a huge potential. So uh, that's where, uh, that's as a moth, that's the light I was drawn to. Well, I love the phrase for the greater good. I had an Irish Nana who was very, very involved in my upbringing. And that was one of the, one of the phrases that I also heard. And I love the statistics and I love the reiteration of the stats of what you said. 70% of our lifestyle. So having not only a thriving mindset, but staying active and all that comes with that. So thank you for confirming that. It's nice to hear that in 2020, that lifestyle is still a predominant factor to aging gracefully and healthy. 
Yes, indeed. It's a, and it's a holistic approach. Most people uh, assume the physical, but it's also the intellectual because our brain has much more capacity than we ever thought. It is the being socially connected. It's very, very important. We're finding more and more uh, how just how important it is. And lastly, to have uh, meaning and purpose in your life. That's, that's absolutely critical, which is by the way uh, we usually... Uh, I'll say handle, but the way we, um, uh, that we deal with older adulthood uh, is just the opposite. We marginalize them and say, you know, go play. You've done your work, and uh, that's destructive. Oh, I fully agree. Now, my second question, every guest on the podcast gets asked this question, and it stems from titling the podcast Imperf Imperfect. So what imperfections do you feel you bring to your heart-centered leadership? Well, uh, being very human-centered and heart-centered um, has gotten me into some trouble in the, the fact that I have uh, perhaps stayed with someone longer than I should have. Uh, someone who was under me and, and in a position of leadership themselves. And, uh, and uh, this, uh, this belief that, uh, that we can do better I have probably gone a little too far that way with some people. Uh, I have done my best, and sometimes I think I failed as a leader when I when I can't bring them around to uh, to, to uh, you know our heartfelt approach and and uh, the greater good and doing the best for the mission and the organization, and and not being uh, narcissistic, which is frequently a, a huge flaw, huge flaw in leaders, and uh, and so uh, I regret. Uh, I don't regret that I stuck with them as a human, but I do regret as a leader that I stuck with some of them uh, where they probably did a little more damage than, than I should have let happen. Well, I want to thank you for, for being open and sharing, you know, your vulnerability in that aspect. And that's something that we hear all too often, either, you know, like you, like you alluded, hanging on too long or working with someone who falls into a leadership role, which we, which we coin accidental leader, and they're not given that fostering and that mentoring. You can't just assign someone the title leader because they have the academic training or experience. It's, it's, it's very much a fostered approach. So really, really appreciate uh, your honesty there. One of the other things I wanted to mention is it's very nice to hear a Western medicine physician say integrative approach. That, that gave me a smile from ear to ear, by the way. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm happy. It, it was a long time in coming because I didn't learn it in medical school. I learned it in life. Well, I, I'm going to leave that right there because I've had <laughs> a lot of physicians say that. Now, Roger, your leadership and medical expertise have been well utilized in a number of significant world events. What has been a commonality that you've observed during these events and how do you feel it's helped you with the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, the, uh, the importance of uh, mission in particularly in the military is, uh, is immense. And uh, in an organization where that mission uh, can lead to injury, death, uh, destruction, um, uh, and still has to be paramount, uh, it uh, has been something that uh, most military leaders struggle with. Those who don't are the ones who are, are troublesome because the people are utmost important. In a, in a civilian role, I can equate the two. Uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, like Southwest Airlines. They, they take care of their people first and the mission comes because of that. And, uh, and I believe that in civilian life. In the military, however, uh, that is a little bit of a different story. Uh, I wasn't a war fighter, I was a physician, but we were still having to do things that, that put some people in danger. And uh, so balancing that was difficult. Now, bringing that to the civilian life I think it's been very helpful to me because um, I, I find that uh, I'm less likely to get, first of all, uh, absorbed with, with me, my career, where I'm going, how this will look, and much more uh, focused on what needs to be done and realizing that, the, that people are going to do that 
to uh, to support them, give them everything they need to do it, and uh, and make sure that I'm leading and and not just directing. Well, it's very important to to foster both of those leadership qualities, especially as a heart centered leader. Now, I know that you have written the award-winning Live Long, Die Short. So I, I had to come up with a great question around this. The phrase, live your dash, comes from one of the most popular poems in the world, The Dash by Linda Ellis. And it means to be mindful that we're only on this earth a little while. It means to spend each day with passion and purpose and inspire other people by living with joy and compassion and kindness, all those beautiful attributes to being a heart-centered leader. So my question for you is, how do you share, share with us how you feel about the way you're living your dash? Uh, Mary Oliver is a poet uh, who used to live in my area. I live in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, U.S. And um, she has a line from one of her poems. You probably no doubt have heard it. And uh, it is, uh, tell me what you plan to do with your one wild and precious life. And, and to me, uh, I, I preach that every day to uh, not only to my uh, team, but to the, to the thousands of older adults that we're able to reach with our content and with our partnerships. Uh, because uh, I alluded to it earlier that uh, purpose in later life gets to be very, very difficult. Um, society has not uh, made it easy and we can fight our way and knock down doors and, and, and perhaps get there, but it shouldn't be that difficult, especially at a time when we're in need of elderhood and the wisdom that comes with elderhood more than ever. And rather than trivializing it or marginalizing it, I think we absolutely have to incorporate it into the society. So with to answer your question, my dash, if, if I'm going to talk about purpose for others, I, I better be sure of what mine is. And, uh, and, and uh, although it was a, a circuitous route to get here, you know, starting in uh, mainline medicine and emergency rooms and, and then in the military all over the world, to, uh, who are mostly young people, to end up focused on older adults. Uh, <laughs> there was a turn there somewhere that I totally didn't expect, but uh, I find that the, uh, the difference that you can make in, first of all, uh, having an older adult aware that, that they absolutely uh, should not be done with purpose and, uh, and that they're needed and that they have skills that are needed by society. And then trying to grease the skids so that uh, they can use that mentorship, wisdom, experience, uh, just humanity and compassion that uh, hopefully comes with older age. It tends to because survivors who last a long time ha are resilient and, and have uh, weathered a lot. And, uh, and so, so my goal is to not only for the individual to find their purpose, and that gives me purpose, but also to, uh, to make the changes necessary so that that is more likely to happen in, in our societies. Well, absolutely. And, and I don't think, you know, those attributes belong just to the senior population. I think more than ever, especially since, you know, the start of COVID on March 11th, I think everybody wants to be seen and heard and loved and valued and validated. And I think this has been a difficult time for seniors. So I'm going to throw in another question here because I'm, I'm loving this conversation with you. How did you make the transition to masterpiece living? What led you to the love of seniors like you've already shared with us? Why masterpiece living and, and what does it mean for you in your life now? And, and if I can be so bold, this is kind of phase two for you in your role. And why did you choose to go to Masterpiece Living? Well, serendipity always plays a role in our lives, doesn't it? That's a, if we don't learn that as we go along, it's, uh, we've, we've missed something very important, and it was serendipitous. After the military, um, I went to work in a large healthcare system doing prevention. Uh, they had convinced me they were very serious about it. Now, I'm going to 
I'm going to talk about a major flaw in U.S. medicine. <laughs> there are many, but this one, and uh, I learned it the hard way. The military was very, very uh, incentivized to practice prevention. Uh, for me as a flight surgeon, they didn't want to lose the aircraft. They didn't want to lose a highly trained person. Uh, and uh, that, was, that was my job. Uh, the mili the, unfortunately, the civilian is not like the military, and uh, I was kind of a little bit Pollyanna and thinking that it was. So after three years of uh, working in prevention there, I was called uh, into the CEO's office and uh, for my annual review, and she said, you are just doing a marvelous job. And I said, well, thank you. I'm all puffed up, you know. And then, then came the but. But you're hurting our revenue. Uh, this was a surprise to me. <laughs> I, uh, I patted myself on the back, but I was surprised that that was, uh, that was uh, con conceived of, that was perceived as a, as a flaw. So uh, I knew I didn't have a whole lot of uh, probably time left in that organization uh, with that kind of culture. So as it turns out, I told you my brother was with the MacArthur Foundation. He called me within a week or two of that meeting and said, look, he said, um, uh, I just was in a taxi cab with Jonas Salk, uh, the famous Jonas Salk of polio vaccine. And he was on the board of the MacArthur Foundation and they had just finished their 10 year long study on aging. And my brother Larry uh, took a cab ride with Jonas to the airport. And Jonas said to him, uh, you know, what we have discovered, namely that it's the choices we make every day uh, that determine how we age is, uh, is the major determinant. He said, that is magnificent and can change the life of every human, but only if someone uh, puts it into practice. And so my brother uh, took that seriously. A few years later, he was in a position to put a group together and he called me that day, a couple weeks after that session and said, would you like to explore this and how we could actually um, bring this into, it, it, you know, make it practical and, and put tools in the hands of older adults and help them in some way. And I said, would you give us a year? I said, definitely. So I did. And here it is uh, 20 years later. And uh, I, I, that, what that has meant to me is we partner with retirement communities, but now we're, we're going out into people in their home to make, first of all, make them aware that it's the choices they make, what kind, of, what kind of choices we're talking about. We're not directing, but we're just making them aware and then facilitating that and, and motivating and educating with content. That has been rewarding for me because uh, I, uh, well, it's when I started, I was a young man and now I'm uh, approaching uh, the age of those uh, that I was initially dealing with and still do deal with. And uh, so that it, it's getting to be very personal. Uh, not, I don't want to be a hypocrite, so I have to practice what I preach. And uh, to see the results uh, of, of a life uh, and, uh, changed remarkably uh, with new vitality, a new direction is, is wonderful. I have a friend, Mark Middleton, uh, who I recommend, by the way, uh, Deb, uh, with Growing Boulder. It, it's a media company that, that talks about uh, just this, uh, what older adults can accomplish and do accomplish. And, and again, I agree with you. This can be any age. I mean, we tend to see it in, uh, in older adults a little bit more. Uh, it, it's in relief, so to speak, and brought in spotlights. But I think it applies to every human with a pulse, <laughs> which is everybody. And, uh, and so it, uh, it gets me out of bed in the morning uh, that, that, I'm, that I'm hearing and I'm seeing this happen. And I'm beginning to see the importance of it for me and how it will change my life and the life of my kids as I start to start early with them and my grandkids. Well, I'll tell you what I love about that. I became a yoga teacher a few years ago, Roger. And before my graduation, my yoga instructor said, come back in a week and you can do your practical yoga flow for, for myself and your peers. But the big question is, I want to know what Deb Crow is going to bring to the yoga mat. And I really, really thought on that because I wanted to be purposeful. And when I looked back at my own life, Roger, in dealing with many different people of different age, different ethnicity, different disabilities, different in, uh, injuries, I thought I need to bring that to the mat. So when I showed up to do my, my test to pass my uh, graduating course in yoga, she said, what are you bringing? And I said, I'm going to bring a chair and I'm going to make, 
and I'm going to make it all inclusive. So I landed up teaching seniors like you. I, I love them. And the average age was 89. And my wow. oldest student was 103. And I asked her one day, I said, Audrey, what's the secret to aging? And she says, I don't worry. She said, I go to bed. She had a little, a little snippet of brandy, she said, before bed. She went to bed without any worry. She had a thriving mindset and she didn't start doing yoga till she was 50. She was on no medication. And I thought, what a role model for the other seniors in the retirement village that she lived in. So I, I share your joy and your kindness and your compassion with seniors. And, you know, we are an aging population now. I remember a few years ago, Reebok did a big branding about how many days we all live, and it was 25,000 and some odd days, which equated out to 71 years old. That was in 2016. And I checked back in uh, about a month ago to look at if that had changed. And it's actually now in the 27,000, and this is Canada anyways, and people are living to 75. So again, it goes back to, to your point of lifestyle is truly 70% combined with that positive, you know, happy and, and cognitive approach and having a thriving mindset to focus on what we can do and not what we can't. So it's just very, very powerful. It is indeed. Kudos to you, because that's not a decision that young people make too often to work with older adults. Uh, uh, the ones that I see there often, I ask them uh, just as an informal survey, did you have a good relationship with your grandparents? And invariably they do, or some older adult. Uh, and, and they were blessed with that, and it has left a mark, and uh, they, they enjoy older adults. I wanted to say something also about what you said, uh, because I think it's important for all of your listeners, no matter what their age, particularly leaders. Uh, there's a long-term uh, study of centenarians in New England. Uh, Dr. Pearl is uh, doing that, has been doing it for some time. And the single most common characteristic of these uh, centenarians, over 100, can't get in the study unless you're over 100, is this sense of uh, optimism. And why should they be optimistic? <laughs> really, uh, you'd ask, uh, most of them, uh, you know, are struggling with aches and pains and, and the like, and know that their time is limited, and yet they are. And they said, so aren't you afraid things will happen? And the, the answer is invariably, well, I've dealt with things before and I will dealt, deal with this when it comes. I am not going to fret over it. I am going to live my life to the max and uh, well, I'll deal with the, the problems as they come along. And to me, that's what I call living in the now. It's, it's all we have control over. Yesterday is gone and tomorrow is not promised. So very sound advice. I'm going to switch gears here and... I like to end the podcast with what I call the fab four. And these are just four fun questions, whatever's sitting on the top of your mind. Here we go. All right, then. <laughs> First one, Roger, share with us something that inspires you. Nature. Nature inspires me. Uh, I, I think it's probably, I believe that we, you know, we were in hunter gatherers for about 99% of the time we've been on earth. And so the, despite the fact that we're moving away from it, uh, it's still so important to us. And so I think it's the rare person that is, doesn't feel enriched and better when they go to nature. So I seek it out whenever I can. Well, I have to agree with you. It's one of my favorite things too. My second question is, where is your favorite place to visit and why? Oh, goodness. Uh, like you, I travel and have been all over the world. And uh, how, do I, how do I judge? But well, I, will, I will tell you the place I go to every February for the month of February uh, and why. I go to Sedona, Arizona. Uh, this is a place uh, with magnificent red rocks, uh, a community of artists and creative people uh, tucked away, uh, surrounded by uh, federal land, therefore can't grow very much. And uh, we go there and uh, I am totally, my battery is charged uh, by the beauty, by the, the physical activity of hiking, um, the, the art that is there, the, uh, the, the performances, and not sure it's gonna be there uh, this next February, but we're gonna give it a go anyway and at least rent a house. 
Well, I'm envious. It's on my list to visit, and I've been told by many, especially in the yoga community, that is, it is one of the best places on earth for energy. They have the best energy there. So there you go, folks. You heard it from Dr. Rogers. So now, now I definitely am more enticed to go. <laughs> now, I'm a big proponent of self-care. It's part of my brand. I, I love to teach people self-care, how to master it, how to put it into our daily our daily living. So what lifestyle characteristics do you have as part of your activities of daily living where you're always honoring your self-care? Well, I try to keep moving. Uh, sometimes uh, people wouldn't classify it as exercise. In fact, we don't use that word, when, especially when we're dealing with uh, older adults because it can be a put off and say, oh, I can't do that. But moving is something else. So I move. A lot of times it is on an exercise bike or, or walking or kayaking, uh, hiking. Uh, uh, and um, I, uh, I, I strive to challenge my brain every day, which is very important. I'm struggling with the social connection part. I, I was a shy as a kid and, uh, and uh, I, I struggled with that for some time, but I, as once again, serendipity, I have turned out to be a, an extremely social person and in need of that social contact. So struggling a bit, but uh, we'll overcome it. And, uh, and we talked about uh, making sure that I'm, I have my purpose in mind, because that, 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 can, that can change from year to year, from minute to minute sometimes, but uh, not, not a steadfast purpose, but uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the important purpose of my entire life that evolves as we age. And so I try to keep focused on that at least periodically to make sure I'm on the right road. Well, I love that. That sounds like a good list. And my last question for you is, what do you want your legacy to be? I can envision a tombstone that said, a great guy. <laughs> uh, to be uh, compassionate and uh, to be uh, someone who uh, marked someone's life in some way so that uh, at least while they're alive, there's, uh, there's a little bit of a, a neuron in there somewhere that, that clicks when they hear Roger or Roger Landry or whatever. Uh, that's, uh, that's about it. It's pretty simple and uh, it's easy to do. Just think about people. Be heart-centered, right, Deb? Absolutely. And uh, it's, it's exactly how I, I wanted to answer your, your comment there. Many people encouraged me to reach out and have you on the show because you are a heart-centered leader. Uh, you've had such a fulfilling career. You retired as a highly decorated full colonel and chief flight surgeon. I think you've embraced all that, that life can hand you. And I think it's so exciting where you are now at Masterpiece Living. And I wanna thank you for your time and your expertise. I look forward to keeping in touch with you. And I also wanted to mention that I absolutely love your theme song for Masterpiece Living, I See You, written by Grant Malloy Smith, who I just interviewed on the show, and Mike Greenlee, who's gonna be interviewed on the show. So it's just, it's a big wor world and we're all interconnected. So I will put that link on your episode description so we can share that with the listeners. And just really grateful, Roger, for your time. Well, thank you. And thank you very much for what you do, Deb. And those two guys, uh, they provided music to us, but a whole lot more that uh, I encourage people to listen to that song. It's, uh, it's, a f it's fine and motivating. Again, thank you, Deb, very much. Well, my pleasure. And I like to end my podcast with my list of five, which I think is a really good list for being purposeful. Follow your heart, have passion, do your best, know your truth, and always be in love with the journey. This is Deb Crow. Thank you for joining me once again on Imperfect, the Heart-Centered Leadership Podcast.